So first of all, thank you to the um, program for having me here and Jenny for inviting. It's great to be here and um, great to be sharing information with all you guys. So thanks for coming. Uh, more volume. I'll just try and speak louder. Um, I think this uh, whole panel here is set up very nicely in the field of uh, greenhouse gas accounting. There's generally three broad fields. Inventory accounting, whole farm approach, heard about that from David Smith. Life cycle accounting, just heard about from Greg Toma. I'm going to talk about project accounting. Um, so when you go to implement an anaerobic digester, for example, how many methane emissions might you reduce? Uh, at the same time, that is um, in the carbon markets we've heard of, the most viable option for agriculture to contribute in dairy in particular is when you implement an anaerobic digester, you can sell carbon offsets. So I'm going to talk about both these things at the same time. Um, just a little overview here, I'll skip through. The most important part of this is that um, in the world of carbon markets, lots of people have been told that money is free, that there it's easy to get money. Um, not true. This is not easy. It's complicated. Um, it takes a long time. And so I'm going to try and give you a, a very real, practical, and unsugarcoated perspective. Um, you probably never heard of Ag Methane Advisors. We're a tiny little consulting firm in Burlington, Vermont. Um, but our focus has been on doing this work um, helping dairies with digesters navigate carbon markets, sell offsets, and get returns for the environmental benefits they provide through reducing methane emissions. Um, obviously, digester projects can um, sell energy as well. They can also um, save money on bedding costs. There's a variety of different revenue streams that contribute to making a digester viable overall. Selling carbon offsets is just one piece of the puzzle and often a small piece of the puzzle. Um, we also have a background in life cycle assessment and got into this work from working on farms and in production agriculture. So um, I tend to find it's very grounding. Um, so in the world of carbon markets, there's been a lot of evolution over the past several years, um, past eight years. There have been these voluntary markets. The Climate Action Reserve was an organization that is a, a nonprofit um, that functions a lot like a regulator. And they um, had the first viable, not the first viable, they had the first protocol that got a lot of momentum and that um, lasted five years. Um, that protocol led into the California Air Resources Board adopting essentially the Climate Action Reserves protocol pretty much word for word. Um, and um, now we have a compliance market, not that the farms participating in that program are required, are mandated to participate, but in the California's larger cap and trade program where um, big energy producers, Pacific Gas and Electric, Chevron, folks like that, the, the 350 largest emitters in the state of California, they are required to reduce their emissions. Farms can voluntarily choose to participate, but we refer to that as the compliance market because it is um, regulated by the California Air Resources Board. There are also um, a couple other um, direct ways in the US to, there are also other carbon markets. So one of them in the Northeast here is REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. A group of Northeast states um, got together and said for power plants, for energy producers, electricity producers, there is a cap and trade program for them. Within REGI, there is the opportunity to create offsets. Nobody's done it yet because there hasn't been enough market incentive, um, but it is an option. There's also other programs that are ways to monetize um, the methane reductions and other environmental benefits, although they're not, a, uh, I often don't refer to them as a carbon market because there's not a commodity being bought and sold and traded. So some of those, for example, are just selling RECs, or in, NYSERDA, in New York through NYSERDA, you can um, just get paid a standard rate for your electricity production. That has environmental benefits wrapped into it, um, but it's not a carbon market. In Vermont, we have uh, Green Mountain Power has their cow power program, where farms that operate digesters get paid an extra four cents per kilowatt hour. Um, we also in Vermont have the feed-in tariff program, uh, Vermont Speed. So those are other ways to monetize these benefits that in a lot of ways are a lot simpler 
and a lot better for farms um, than going through the whole rigmarole I'm going to talk to you about about carbon offsets. But um, uh, but they are limited in their scope. We don't have any of those on a national level. We don't have any of those um, in they're just limited in their scope and they're very specific to smaller smaller regions. So um, in terms of essentially there's an economic question. Um, this is not a simple thing to do. Um, what are the costs involved? How many offsets get created? Um, what's involved in bringing them to market? Um, what's involved in getting them approved. This commodity is going to be bought and sold uh, from reducing this thing that nobody can touch. You can put your hand on a gallon of milk. You can drink it. Um, you can't from a methane reduction. So how do you go through this process to document that this actually happened? And how much does it cost you and how much are you going to make? So if you are considering this in financing your project, your mitigation project, um, what can you expect? Um, you also, some of the requirements are to install monitoring equipment. So we need to document how much biogas is produced. So every combustion device, if you have an engine, a boiler, and a flare, you need a biogas flow meter recording every 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, how much biogas is being produced. And you also have to prove that that's been destroyed um, before you can say it's been um, reduced. Um, so there's costs associated with that. Then they, there's verification. There's um, essentially you have an auditor come in after all the work's been done, after you follow the quantification methodologies, hire somebody to come in and say, yes, all the data the farm's provided is true and accurate and they can support it. All the work ag methane advisors or whoever you're working with did follows the rules and yes, this can be approved. Um, and so all of this costs money, it takes time, and you're probably not going to actually sell your offsets for 18 to 24 months in reality. So that's a long time. So how much money are you going to invest in it, and how quickly are you going to see returns? So to articulate this, um, we're using a couple different examples here. Um, we're assuming New York dairy farms, since we're in New York here. Um, a large dairy, we're assuming about 1,500 mature cows. A very large dairy, about 4,000 mature cows. Um, some of the other assumptions are that we're using an anaerobic digester to do this, to create these offsets, not a covered lagoon. Um, the, we're assuming that of all the milking cows, 100% of their, before the digester was installed, 100% of the manure was managed in an anaerobic lagoon. If you had, if it wasn't managed in an anaerobic lagoon, a farm with 4,000 cows isn't going to be um, land applying all their manure every day. It's just not going to happen for a variety of water quality reasons we heard about. Um, but if it was some amount less than that, well, you're not going to, if your baseline isn't um, anaerobic lagoon storage, you're not going to have many methane emissions to reduce in the first place. Um, we also, we just, for dry cows, we assume that there's 50% of manure is in the lagoon, 50% is in solid storage. Um, most farms, I think most of their dry cows are, all the manure goes to a lagoon, but um, just trying to do that to be conservative here. Um, so a couple other assumptions here, important ones are um, the methane concentration of the biogas and the amount of biogas produced per cow per day. Um, and then another really important one is there's this 80-page quantification methodology we follow to do this. It's the regulatory document. And in it, the, um, what produces the methane in the anaerobic lagoon is the volatile solids that are in the manure. Um, when the bacteria eat those volatile solids, they excrete the methane in, in simple terms. Well, if you empty your lagoon, a lagoon builds up sludge at the bottom of it. If you empty that every year, um, and you scrape out all that sludge, then all of your volatile solids have been taken out of their anaerobic environment. And if they're taken out of their anaerobic environment, then you, there would be less assumed methane produced in the baseline. And so part of our job is to help farms create as many offsets as they can to help finance as many, to help finance their digesters as best they can. And so in that sense, um, 
in some situations, we just we have to be very careful. If if lagoon scraping does happen with all the sludge taken out, we are very particular about noting it. Um, but if it doesn't, we want to be very clear to the regulators that this didn't happen. Um, so this is a um, this is our estimated volumes. We've used a calculation tool created by the Climate Action Reserve. It's an Excel spreadsheet that they provide. Um, it does the quantification methodology of the Air Resources Board protocol. And we've just come up with some conservative estimates here of how much these two, how many offsets these two farms might produce. So we have just under 8,000 um, for the about 1,500 head dairy and 21-ish thousand for the 4,000 head dairy. And so just uh, don't want this to go in passing, but one offset is equal to one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. So in general, the more cows you have, the more manure, the more methane is produced, the more offsets. No question about that. Um, some of the details of how this gets calculated, we just use the default assumptions. So I talked about volatile solids, excuse me. Um, but this other value is the B sub zero. It's a pretty standard industri industry default and scientific default of the metric tons of methane produced per kilogram of volatile solids. Um, what's also important to mention through this and from Dave Smith's presentation, we saw that methane has different global warming potentials, uh, as high as 26, perhaps, depending on which IPCC assessment report you look at. Um, the regulators and programs that issue these commodities that can be bought and sold and traded, they largely to be conservative. Um, they don't want to create more commodities in the world to be sold than were actually reduced. They use the, the global warming potential of 21 um, rather than they don't update to 25 as it comes out and things like that. So if we're selling a commodity, obviously, what are we going to sell it for? Well, over 2009 to 2014, maybe these offsets sold for between 7 and $9. It varies a lot, um, or it's varied some. But today, um, when I look at my email tonight and the brokers who've sent me prices, it'll probably say $10.10, something like that. So those, those are conservatively today, if you went out to sell offsets today, maybe $9.50. Maybe you get as high as 1050. There's some variation there. Um, when we look out a few years, really, um, politics could change in the state of California. Um, somebody could dismantle the program. That's not very likely, but really, we don't just hesitant about projecting too far in the future. There's all sorts of economic studies. Um, honestly, those numbers I put there are somewhat arbitrary, um, and just wanted to put that caveat out there. But because this is a dynamic and risky market, because things can change quickly, there's value in potentially having a price floor. Um, and so one of my clients is actually in the room, and I've talked to him about this before. In, in selling, if you, could, if you were going to sell offsets for five years, um, and the price could potentially go down to $2, if you could get a guarantee that you were going to sell them for $5, that was going to be the lowest price somebody would buy, that mitigates a lot of your risk. Um, and so that's something it's, we, haven't, we haven't seen that. Um, there hasn't been, the, on the demand side, the buyers don't really want to offer that recently. What's good, though, is that the California cap and trade regulation has a price floor for their allowances. Um, allowances are the commodity that the regulated entities would use. And um, that price floor, offsets will always be discounted to allowances, always a little bit cheaper, but at least that price floor of those allowances should keep offsets on a, on a slight upward trajectory. Um, okay. So what does it cost to do this? Let me see how much time we'll go through here. Um, these flow meters, let's say you had, assuming for the large dairy scenario, you have one engine, a boiler, and a flare. You can get them from different vendors, but we're just using $16,000 as a ballpark. You add a second engine for the very large dairy, that's another $3,500 to $4,000 for another flow meter. Um, 
you need to document the methane concentration of the biogas taking quarterly methane concentration samples. So uh, sometimes a farm has to go out and buy um, their own. That might cost about $2,500. Um, there's also some transaction fees for the Climate Action Reserve. They just, they're a nonprofit, um, but they, they need some revenue. And so they charge some fees to set up an account. There's a cost $500 a year to keep your account open. So there's some small fees for that. But what we see between these two projects, um, and we'll see it more in a minute, is that costs are pretty similar, whether you're a very large dairy um, producing 20,000 offsets a year or producing um, a much smaller volume. So in terms of annual operating costs, um, I have farms account for their own time and their staff time managing the projects differently. So I've left that out of here it's probably relatively small in the whole business model of um, selling these offsets. I've also left out of here what ag methane advisors would charge. I'm happy to talk to anybody about it, but I've left it out of here because there's a variety of different business models to do it. Ag methane advisors is a consulting firm. There's other companies out there who um, take ownership in the offsets, which ag methane advisors doesn't do. So that can vary a lot from say 10% of the overall revenue to as high as 40% depending on who's doing the work. So I've left that out of here because there's so much variation. But some of the things we can, um, if you have biogas flow meters, sometimes the, they drift. You have calibration drift and you need to send them in for a repair. Sometimes they get hit by lightning. Um, so we've just included some relatively small amounts. Hopefully you don't have an issue with more than one meter a year. Um, and uh, so some small amounts each year. Then hiring a verifier. Um, $10,000 is a good ballpark number to have this auditor come in, um, make sure all the rules have been followed, and um, that's a pretty good ballpark. So the Climate Action Reserve for their transaction fees, they often also charge about $0.25 cents, uh, per offset. And then for brokerage fees, if you're going to um, ag methane advisors or whoever can help you sell these offsets, but there are just like buying a house, you can do for sale by owner, and that can work very well. But there's also sometimes you get an MLS listing and you can reach thousands of people quicker. So sometimes brokers can be very helpful if you choose to use a broker. They also charge about 25 cents each. So those numbers for registration and brokerage, I calculated the volumes from before off these 25 cents a piece. So we can see that the costs still are not very different. Um, some ways to save some money in doing this um, are you have options to go through a verification once every 12 months or once every 24 months. Um, often I recommend for farms that are getting into this for the first time, go use the 12-month option. You know what the process is like. You've gotten through it. Um, and you know how rigorous it is. You know you've had a verifier and the regulators vet all of the data you've provided, questions about when your project started, um, things like that. So get through it the first time. And then after that, um, use the 24-month option. The 24-month option is available to farms that produce less than 25,000 tons a year. Even the 4,000 cow dairy, in most situations, is going to produce less than that volume. So most folks can use that option. Um, so here's sort of the summary. If you, assuming $10 today, this large dairy producing 8,000 tons, the very large dairy producing 21,000 tons, there's a very different amount of revenue they're going to have come in. Their uh, costs are not that different. So obviously, um, very different net, very different profits. Um, and let's see, a couple other things. I just want to mention a couple things we did. Another thing we did leave out of this is, is contracting. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about contracting in a minute. But we left, I left legal costs out of this. People have all different legal arrangements. But you, um, the offset sales contracts are rigorous commodity documents. A farm might be making an agreement directly with a huge utility. Um, who has a legal staff of 150 lawyers. And so you want to be very careful about what contracts you get into. Um, and so there's certainly some cost related to that. Um, and it's also important to note that this is just, 
at these 2015 returns here, this is just one year, um, but you have a 10-year crediting period. And so that 10-year crediting period, at the moment, the Capital Trade Regulation only goes to 2020. They are, California is working on expanding it out to 2030, 2040, but these projects can create this for 10 years. So um, certainly, if you're a very large dairy making $185,000 a year for 10 years, that's a lot of money. Um, and that's sort of a clear, clear profit motive there. In the, in the 1,500 cow scenario, $60,000 a year. I told one farmer um, that that was a conservative estimate. We'll hope to make them more than that, but that's a conservative estimate. He said he'd pay that much money to keep verifiers and regulators off of his farm. So not as clear of a profit motive. And, um, and that's just, that's, that's the reality of it, and don't want to hide that, but it's uh, at $60,000 a year, some folks um, that may be important to get the project over its hump to make the project viable. In other situations, it's more trouble than it's worth. And so it's dependent upon the situation and the preferences. So um, how am I doing on time here? Yeah, I think you're just winding up. OK. So um, some of the, I'll try and finish up quickly here. Um, I've talked about a lot of these things. There, the project monitoring and managing these biogas flow meters is, is the most crucial thing. And so working the, the f a lot of times farms say, you know, I don't know who this guy is calling me to try and sell my offsets. I know he's trying to make me money, but I have to focus on um, producing milk. And that's what farmers do best, and that's what they should focus on. Um, when there is somebody who manages the digester, somebody who manages the engine, somebody who manages the biogas flow meters, and they are diligent, um, and they can keep the good flow of data coming through, then this can be viable. If this is something that they cast aside and they don't think about for a year, and they come back at the end of the year and say, I want my offsets now, and I say, you haven't returned my phone calls for a year, can't do much for them. And so um, that's, the, that's the crucial part of this. Um, Regulatory compliance is also huge. And so this is, um, that goes into air permits, that goes into manure management, CAFO permits, um, New York pollutant discharge elimination system permits, even OSHA. Um, agriculture is inherently dirty, or dairy is inherently dirty, it's also dangerous. And so um, this little excerpt from the regulation essentially says that if all environmental health and safety permits are not followed, um, and it's found that sometime during the reporting period, which is usually a year in length, they were not followed, the project is not eligible to create offsets for the entire year. I have a client in Wisconsin who had a manure spill. Dairies have manure spills, it's a fact of life. They did, that day they called Department of Natural Resources. They had it cleaned up in 48 hours. They had a report submitted to DNR in a week. DNR in a month had a report back saying, you did everything you were supposed to. Yes, this happened, but you're now in compliance. The California Air Resources Board wants to not let them create offsets for an entire year for a two-day event. That's not, I don't think that's reasonable, and we're fighting that in a variety of different ways, but that's what the regulation says at the moment, and so it's a really important thing to consider because um, a lot of people aren't used to having, um, aren't, aren't used to that. They think they've done everything they were supposed to do within their state, within their permits, and these end up being consequences down the line. Um, it's also the, I think the last point I'll make here is that this regulatory compliance in this California market, if it's found after the fact that um, a project was out of compliance, um, if there was something, sometimes regulators come back two years later and say, hey, now we've determined that you're out of compliance. For eight years after the offsets are created, um, if it's found that a project was out of compliance, those offsets can be invalidated. So if at that point a farm has sold them, they've been paid, the contract is done, it's not the farm who's left holding the bag there, but it's the buyer, the user, the um, big compliance entity in California who has the legal staff of 150 people, they're the ones left holding the bag, 
but that trickles all the way back down. And so you have to be very careful about your documentation, your re regulatory compliance there as well. So thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer any questions later.